the way that I worked with the way that I work with Jim a lot is that he'll show me raw footage before it's edited and tell me the backstory of the characters. And a lot of times I get to see more of the story than makes it into the final film. And then I go back and I sometimes I'll do it directly to the footage that he gives me. Sometimes I'll watch it and just think about it and think about the situation and improvise and then I'll send him some ideas and sometimes he'll use uh, the ideas I send him, you know, even stuff I've recorded on the phone and we'll edit it together to fit the film. And one of the things that I really like about working with Jim on these films is the way that he uses space. So instead of having something sort of continuous, I'll just put... something like that all the time. What we might do is do like just let it ring like that and it, I've, to me that carries some emotion I'll be interested to hear what other people have to say about that but let's take that again Of course, everything is not going to kind of meander that way, and, and I like to feel like that took more of an emotional journey than an intellectual journey, because I was just thinking a little bit about the films and about the setting. Sometimes you do want to have a little bit more structure. And um, one of the things that we did for the last film, Gatherings, is we used part of a hymn that was in a scene and then built a couple of different pieces of music around that. So the piece was called Praise Him and um, there's a very scored version of that that takes us through the end of the film but at the very end there's also a sort of a, an acoustic meditation on that and that's what I'm going to play now.
that was praising. How's is the sound better? Everybody can hear well? Yes, I'm hearing it well. Okay, good. So uh, another piece that we did for the last film, this doesn't happen very often, but there occasionally are pieces that I've written ahead of time, and um, they get brought into the film. So this piece is very upbeat. I'm going to turn the guitar down a little bit because it might get a little loud. So something like a, a carnival scene or a big ending scene sometimes. Like I said, this film, the ending, used Praise Him, uh, but like a really big upbeat thing. And this is an example of that. Anyway, so that's, that's kind of the basics. We have a little bit of all of those elements in there. Um, sometimes we'll do something a little bit more specific style-wise. Style so um, I like to play blues. And I've used some blues in the Barrier Island projects, but a lot of times when I do that, I do that with a slide guitar. And I'm going to take a quick second and switch instruments and switch positions and show you that. So one second for me. Okay, so this guitar is the brand of guitar is a dobro, and dobro is sometimes used kind of the way you might use Kleenex to indicate the type of guitar it is, but actually it's a resonator guitar. And this is the resonator. There are different varieties of them. Some of them have a square back neck because they're meant to be played like this. This guitar has a round neck and it has a regular string nut. And I used an additional piece to raise the string action. So this guitar can be played conventionally. And right now I have it set up for slide. Um, the reason the strings are high is so that you get a smoother sound from the slide instead of the slide hitting the frets. Or the, and it allows you to press down on the strings. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Um, if I need to repeat anything, just... Uh, Kristen break in and I'll, I'll redo that. But what I was saying is that this resonator guitar has a special nut on it that raises the string action. You can see how high it is here. And that allows me to play slide. It actually makes it impossible to play regular 
but I can remove this if I wanted to do that. And normally these guitars are played with uh, finger picks, but I actually don't feel comfortable with finger picks, so I either use my fingers or a flat pick. <laughs> times I like to have fun with these slide pieces uh, play a little bit swingy about film scoring is that you end up with a lot of working titles and that piece or a, a variation of it was called Duck Talk spelled of course the New York way T-A-W-K um, just because it reminded me of ducks and this was for Welcome to the Table where there are a lot of animals and people having fun and having food and it was, the mood was really fun and happy so I just wanted to get a little bit of that energy in here. So I'm imagining a bunch of ducks walking around, uh, not about to get eaten because they would be a lot sadder. They would be, I think, if they were about to get eaten, but they're just walking around the farmyard. <laughs> guitar can also be very mournful and one of the reasons that we use slide I mean I could play that on one of the other guitars on a 12 string it would actually still have a lot of that fun vibe but instruments like slide give us a sense of place and a little bit of time but to me when you hear this sound Feel like you're it, you're hearing the outdoors. You're hearing like a back porch and a warm evening. things that uh, some of you might notice is that I'm just playing I'm playing a chord without putting any fingers down or even putting the slide down and this is called an open tuning and there are a lot of different open tunings you can use this is in open A I'm pretty sure yeah 
This is an open A. So open A is a, an A chord. If anybody plays the guitar, it's sort of the first position A chord. So the E string is the same, the A string is the same, the D string is tuned up to D, the G string is tuned up to A, the B string is tuned up to C sharp, and the E string stays the same. That's what's called a stretch tuning in that the strings are, that are retuned are tighter than normal. If I tune this to G, which is essentially the same tuning, the guitar is going to be a little looser and the feel of it is a little bit different. And I actually use open G tuning on a lot of the stuff that we record. Um, convent as well as slide. But the disadvantage especially with the action like this, so you can't change anything with your fingers of open tuning, is that everything is kind of stuck in this major chord if you want to use the whole thing. So one thing we do sometimes is change the tuning, and here I'm just going to make this a minor. chord progression but now I switch back to major and what a difference in texture that makes it. we use a lot in the films, harmonics. Um, I'm going to switch back to the other guitar. You'll be able to see how they work together with um, notes played conventionally. But I feel like harmonics are a texture. And what you might 
what you might be able to tell from just some of the stuff we've done so far is that the, the texture makes a big difference. The, it's, the, the parts that I'm playing aren't actually all that different um, from one another, but by switching instruments or by casting something in a minor tuning or by using slide, you create these different textures. And so even a very simple piece like the last one, which is really just two chords, um, played in different places in different ways, can convey a scene or convey a moment or an emotion without stepping on the dialogue. Uh, one of the things that I always find is very distracting is when there's sort of this bed of, you know, kind of classically based music that's just always there and it's just churning away in the background. It just classically based music is obviously very appropriate for a lot of film work, but for um, something where people are talking to just have a constant bed, you, you kind of, you, you lose the effect of the music. So if you have this very simple bed that can sit under dialogue, and this is something actually that I've, I've learned a lot from working with Jim because he's excellent at making sure that the music and the dialogue work without it seeming like, you know, where somebody says something and it's like, you know, big dramatic da-da-da-da kind of moment. So I'm going to switch now to another instrument. And another tuning. So this is, this is 12 string. And for anybody who is uh, familiar with the guitar, the 12 string is essentially the same as a six string, except the bottom four strings have an octave drone string that goes with them. two are unison pairs, which is like a mandolin. Now this is tuned to a, another alternate tuning that uh, is called dadgad, and that's because the strings are tuned D A D G A D, and it has a, a sort of a modal tone to it. So now we're we're kind of using an instrument that is maybe not a highly featured instrument in American music. The 12 string is there, but it's not, you know, usually the number one instrument other than people like Leo Kotke. Um, but we're also using it in a way that takes us a little bit away from a more traditional sound into something a little bit darker, but also kind of interesting. <laughs> I could write a book on tuning a 12 string, but uh, you'd be reading the whole book and it would still, you'd still be tuning the 12 string by, before you got to the end, after you got to the end.
So for me, as a composer and as a player, something like using a, a tuning like that, and that just happens to be one of my favorites. I have some others um, that I use as well. Uh, it, it takes me someplace different. Like, it just allows me to, to listen. So one way to compose is to have a piece of music in your head, and you hear it, and you translate it to an instrument. Uh, another way is to basically sit down the way you would if you were writing a letter to, uh, I don't know, the tax office. I, I hate to put it that way, but it's true. You sit there and you think, what am, I, what am I trying to say? And you start out and say, you know, you have a paragraph about that long, about uh, you're not going to pay your taxes, and you want to be reimbursed, and then by the time you're done, you have a two-sentence uh, letter saying, please find my check for my taxes. So there's that, what I call that is uh, kind of sculpting it down. You're you're starting with an intent, but you're also disciplined, disciplined enough to um, bring it down to the conclusion you need to reach. And then the final way, uh, which I do a lot on these projects, probably more on these than on any other work that I do, either music or writing, is to just let my mind go and try to be in the emotion of what I'm seeing or the situation. As I mentioned earlier, in the presentation and using a tuning like that allows me to do it because what happens by the nature of it is I have to listen more carefully. I can't kind of go on autopilot. The fingerings are different, the sound is different. And so rather than impose my will on the music, I'm, I'm imposing some will. I'm kind of like pushing it along here, 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 but I'm also being pushed along as well by what I hear. If I hear something really lovely, or that I think is lovely, then it inspires me. So on that last piece, um, actually, I hit... <laughs> when I hit that, when I hit this chord, it sort of took me somewhere. I wasn't thinking about where it was going to take me. And if you've been watching my hands, again, I'm sort of in the same positions I was earlier with the more conventional guitar tuned to standard tuning. So I'm not right now doing anything very different physically, but the sound is different, and so that's also taking me someplace different emotionally and ends up with a different piece for the film. So um, come back to this guitar. Another thing that will provide a texture within the guitar family is to use something called a capo. Um, and a capo basically changes the, the lowest pitch available on the guitar. So here, it's changed the guitar. It's made it a fourth higher. So instead of E, the lowest note is A. Now, sometimes people will use a capo so that they can play whatever tuning they like, and still use open chords, and that's a very valid way to use it. Um, but another benefit of it is by tightening the strings, it gives the guitar a different texture, a different sound. So if I was to play this, with my fingers versus using the capo, One of them is warm, the one with my fingers. One of them is very bright and lively.
So, um, finally, on the guitar, another thing that uh, we like to use, and I mentioned earlier about leaving space, um, but to have drones, and right now I have a little bit of reverb on this guitar, but what we would do if we were recording is I would record the part and then I might actually play around with the effects a little bit to add some echo and some other things to enhance this sort of drone in the background here. Now, believe it or not, these spacious, uh, spacious pieces are actually the most difficult to record because Okay, so for example there, when I lifted my finger, there's like a, a squeak, like any little bit of noise distracts from these. Fortunately, there's uh, stuff in the background a lot of times in a soundtrack that can cover up a little bit of that stuff, but you just have to be very focused. So those are the main instruments I use. Uh, occasionally we'll use some banjo. The first time I actually play the banjo was for Our Island Home. And it was quite a learning process for me because I look at it and I think, okay, you know, you got frets, you got strings, what could be so hard? Well, it's tuned completely differently. You got a high 
high string on the bottom, at least on this kind of banjo, five string banjo. Uh, banjos tend to use open tunings. And they definitely carry their own kind of very specific set of references for most of us. So a lot of times with musical instruments, we think of things, or when I say we, I really mean I do. I think of things as associated with a style or a place. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the way we're conditioned, right? We've seen movies with banjos in country music or whatever, but the banjo is actually an instrument that originated in Africa and has a lot of different musical uh, threads to it. Uh, however, the technique that most of us associate with, with banjo is also relatively new and is pretty hard for somebody like me to play. So what I do is I just use it for a little bit of texture. The dobro, uh, actually even more so than the dobro, the banjo is usually played with finger picks, like metal finger picks, and that's how you get that sound. Um, if I had something really challenging to do with it, I would hire somebody to play it. But for just a little bit of texture, I think it adds a lot. Okay, and um, I am going to uh, just close the demo part of the performance there. If anybody has any questions, please uh, feel Kristen, please. Uh, thank you for listening, and then we'll, you know, we'll do one piece of something to kind of close it out. Emil, that was wonderful. Uh, very good. Uh, David Phillips sent in a question um, when he registered for the class, and he asked, when scoring a film, do you see a rough cut before you begin composing? Yes, and actually what I see is multiple rough cuts all the way from raw interview footage, so uncut basically, or like really rough cuts. So let's say Jim has interviewed somebody for, I don't know, half an hour. I might see 10 minutes of that, and in the final film, maybe two or three minutes of that will be in the film and it might be spaced out over quite a while. So I see that. Um, as the film starts to come together, I will see scenes that are cut. So let's say we have that same interview and now the um, person's talking and is cooking. So now the voiceover is continuing from the interview, but I'm seeing them do stuff. Or I'm seeing archival footage. That happens a lot when we have the historian on. Um, I'll see the archival footage that he's using, and that becomes really important in the score because it's taking us away from the main part of the score, right? We're going back in time, so the music a lot of times will change. It'll definitely not be music that carries over thematically into the, the rest of the thing. So if I, let's say I write a piece that's sunrise kind of piece for the contemporary action, and I might have a kind of a slow version and a minimalist version, kind of like I was playing, and then maybe a brighter version with a couple of instruments, that piece will only be used for the contemporary action. So if, even if you had a sunrise from, let's say, 1940, somebody's telling a story of the sun rose and the ducks were flying or whatever it is, that music will not be the same. So see that rough cut? I'm starting to now write toward the time and the place. And I'm kind of doing what I was doing before, kind of improvising and seeing what fits. And I'll send, Jim's great because I'll send him stuff. Um, and he'll say, oh yeah, I use that. Like, when I, when I used to be the editor of a, a music magazine for students. And a lot of times I'd be sitting and working at my desk, but always had instruments in the office. and. To relieve tension, I get up, grab a guitar, and play. And a lot of times, good ideas would come when I was doing that because I was thinking about something else. And I'd record.
record them on my phone. I'd send them to Jim, and then he'd go, oh, yeah, I used that version. And, and I said, but Jim, I re-recorded it, and it's way better. He goes, yeah, but the original one was better. It was like, I wasn't thinking too much, you know? It was so, anyway, so it's a rough cut that goes both ways, too. I'll send him stuff. Then as we get closer, we see a real rough cut where the whole film comes together, and he and I, uh, at least twice, sometimes three or four times, will sit together and watch either the whole movie or specific scenes and say, okay, you know, he'll say, well, I use this piece here, what do you think goes here? And I'll write something for it, but then it'll start to also tighten because always the challenge for him is to get them, you know, they would be three hour movies if, if he didn't have to cut them down because there's always so much good material. So we start to cut. Sometimes new scenes come in. Sometimes a scene where a piece of music was working but the scene has to go because it's too long. Then that piece gets repurposed. All that kind of stuff. And at the very end, we do a final run through with the very final cut. And that's where like something might be timed. Like that praise him example. That was... I think I did, uh, I think I did like 12 versions of that, almost all of them uh, similar. So they would start the same. And some of the versions were different mixes of the same thing. But as he was cutting it, he kept fine tuning it. And because we had specific cuts on frames of the film, I had to, I had to edit the music. But also what would happen is, if we, let's say you extend a moment, like a kid is outside spinning, and the kid's outside spinning for four and a half seconds. Too long, it's like, and then it cuts to um, people playing music. And so that's a very specific thing. So you want to be able to take, you, you want to take the viewer from the kid spinning to the people playing music all part of one sequence, but you also don't want it to be like you're playing the music that you're seeing on screen, because it's not that. It's not their music. Their music might even be really quietly in the background as background noise. What it is is just carrying over that feeling. So let's say now you've cut that girl spinning to one sound, and you have to make that transition. So how much do you give her versus the people in, you know, the adults playing music. Maybe you carry her music or her texture, or her instrument over a little bit longer and then bring in the other instruments. And, and in the case of that song, it was interesting too because you had this piano in a church with voices. And we don't use voices in the background music. That's all. Any voices you hear are all. Um, organic to the film. So you go from that to this variation of it. And in that case, we had electric instruments, we had strings, and we had a lot of different versions with more strings, more electric, a little bit of rock here, big, bigger here, smaller. And we, it just took us as all those takes to get it to where it felt it was right. It wasn't too bombastic. It was still connected to the end. It had the sort of emotional arc. So that's it. So that, so even then, when you're toward the final cut, you're working with rough cuts until the very end. And I think we even modified it a little bit after the premiere. Uh, OK. From Valerie, she asks, how do you record your instruments? Logic Pro? Yeah, actually, most of the time. Um, and depending on uh, where I am, uh, I'll use, I have a universal audio interface, and that's what I'm using today. Um, and other times I'll use like something smaller. Uh, I wrote a lot of uh, gatherings, actually, while we were on vacation. Uh, we were at an Airbnb uh, or a VRBO state. And so I wrote a lot of stuff there using like a little portable Zoom kind of thing. And uh, Later, I was listening back, and I'm like, what the heck? There's like clicking, and sometimes uh, buttons of my shirt, like I have to pay attention <laughs> to all that kind of stuff. The less 
music that's going on, the more you have to pay attention to the buttons on the shirt or the crickets outside, which you may or may not be able to hear. Um, but anyway, I heard this thing, and it was the ceiling fan at the vacation place. And we ended up using it because it still worked, but it was like, you know, sometimes you just use what you got. Okay, Mark asks, and you may have touched on this um, earlier. He asks, says, I'm curious about how the film content influences musical choices, instrument, chord changes, etc. Also, does the music get busier when there's less going on in the film and vice versa? Uh, okay, so as far as the film, it definitely influences musical choices. And um, what's interesting about it for me is my background musically is obviously playing the guitar, playing acoustic guitar, but I play electric guitar and I've done a lot of stuff with synthesizers and occasionally in these films you'll hear a little bit of synthesized music um, or like sampled strings and things like that but even in those cases uh, I used to play the viola and I still kind of play I was I'm not good enough to sit and play it for you live um, play the violin but what I'll do is I'll record something with strings and then add a real violin on top as just a texture because to me, it has to feel connected to the to the people. So, for the Barrier Island music, there's there are a couple things at play. One is when we did the first one, it felt really appropriate to focus on Americana instruments. So I used mandolin and banjo and guitar and fiddle on that one. A little bit, little bit of. Uh, sort of string bed stuff, but it was, it was for a very specific piece called The Sea. And then as we went along, we obviously we started to come back to those instruments. So because this music is tied to a place and the series is tied to the same place, we try to keep it the same. Now, as far as the chord changes go, yes. Um, I also, It'll also sometimes just be where I happen to be playing or writing. So, for example, um, I like to play, for this music, I like to play open chords and, and stuff where I can, um, so a lot of stuff in the key of G, just because it's got a nice open sound to it. And then, So I'm going to take something that uh, we used in Welcome to the Table. to me worked because there was a lot of stuff about tradition and about the connection of generations and I thought it doesn't sound too old-timey you know I, I don't want to do something that well sometimes it's appropriate to do something that's very you know stylistically specific but it, it, it's it sounded old sentimental but not too sad right so and the thing about it that was interesting was it could be varied so it could be a little bit sad but but more like a memory you know, so it was happy, sad. It was kind of the way you feel when you think fondly of somebody you miss. And, but it could also be, it'd be like very festive. So something
something like that where, um, you know, I, I wanted to s stay in as a sort of uh, physical framework too, like just the practicality of playing the guitar in this key gives me some options that would be different in a different key. Other keys give you other different options, but... Anyway, um, as far as the stuff getting denser when there's more action, generally, uh, it depends, I guess, the only way to put it. It really depends on the scene. It also depends on who you're working with. So, with, like I said, in Jim's case, I might give Jim something like this. And he, he might turn it into this by editing. You know, then I have to go back and make it a tail for that, like, you know, add something so that it, does, it fades out properly. You know, that's a kind of a, it's a little hard to perform an example of that. Usually that would be more of a thing with a, uh, something like this, but. So one of the things um, I would say is, in the case of these projects, is to err on the side of having the music be small for the scene as opposed to overpower the scene. It's, that's the worst, you know? Can you imagine their, their mom's recipes, right? And how important their mom's recipe book is to them. And you've got like, you know, you know, big stuff with like six different instruments playing at the same time. And that gets me back to that thing I was saying about like uh, history channel documentaries like somebody's talking it's like rah, 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 with the music I'm just please <laughs> save me so um, so that's the case for these um, you know a lot of times obviously today I haven't done any stuff with layered instruments um, but we do we don't just do solo instruments but we do a lot of solo instruments or a lot of two instruments and one of the things that I think has worked very well about that is if you have this right then this sounds huge I think that's been a very effective technique for us is to start with something really small or very sparse or very spacious and then just playing a big chord sounds big and then adding a second instrument to that can sound really really huge all right sally asks is there one bic documentary that you are particularly fond of and one that came to you very quickly and easily could be two different films i guess too yeah the second question is none of them come that quickly right. <laughs> but that's also part of because uh i mean i don't know if people are aware i know you guys are aware and sally's aware it, it there those projects take time to do jim spends a lot of time filming um i'll start composing really early like after he's done his first shoot and then It'll sometimes be almost a year later when we finish. Um, usually, usually the musical ideas come fairly quickly, uh, though. That is true. Like I'll, I've never sat down to to record for these or compose for these and been at a total loss or come up with nothing. I think it's more like what I was saying before. Like when I was at work and I would, you know, I'd be writing and then I would just pick up a guitar and go, oh, you know, especially, especially for Welcome to the Table, for some reason, that project, I wrote so much of the stuff at work and stuff I really liked. As far as uh, which is my favorite, I like all of them, actually. I would say that for different reasons, different ones stand out. Uh, I 
think welcome to the table because I felt like that had some really nice set pieces of music that I was very proud of. I, I really liked them as standalone pieces. So a lot of times a piece that you write for a film score, if you listen to it on its own, you know, it, 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 it's not like something you'd put on the playlist on, you know, Spotify. But um, Welcome to the Table has a lot of that. I think the, the musical journey in gatherings is uh, one of my favorites because it starts very quietly and it builds to a big crescendo. And in gatherings, the music is really directly connected to the music of people who are in the movie. So that was really nice, like working on that Praise Him piece. And doing it in a way that didn't wasn't just a direct ripoff, but was enough of a ripoff to work. Uh, that I was proud of that. It took a lot of work to do it. Um, so that was that. And um, the spirit of the bird actually was something that I I really enjoyed for for a couple of reasons. One of which I I really just love the film. Um, but there's a um, there's a, a pickup company called Seymour Duncan Pickups and that's actually what I use in a lot of my guitars and having been in the guitar media industry like I've been to their factory and one day after having done the film on Facebook and who's but um, it's from the Chesapeake area had bought a, a duck decoy for his collection. So I sent him a copy of the movie and uh, I felt this really nice connection between like the stuff that brought me into the guitars and also into my media career with my music. So that was really nice. And of course, Our Island Home, which was the first one we did, um, stands out to me because A was the first one and B uh, just because it was the story of something that had vanished and so much of what I love about doing these films is that it's a it's a continuing story and even Our Island Home is a continuing story but that one it, it just it just moved me a lot so um, and it was really a pleasure to to work on that and and set the foundation for everything else that we've done musically. Well, that's, those are the questions I have. Are there any other questions from anyone that would like to ask now? And if not, I think well, about, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, thank Yeah, thank you, Kristen, so much. Emil, this is Sally Dickinson. Um, I really enjoyed your performance and your talk um, today. It was, it was wonderful. and. You know, once again, as I listen to your music, I think the, the A, we were incredibly, the Barry Allen Center was incredibly fortunate um, to have found Jim to work with, but, but equally and as important is, is finding you and your talent in, um, in composing the music for the films because they truly, truly make the film. So um, okay. both of you together are just, uh, remarkable and and um, we are very very grateful um, very fortunate to have you um, working with us on these projects and preserving the beautiful coastal history of the eastern shore and that and that wonderful culture that we celebrate thank you so much well thank you I feel very uh, fortunate to be involved in it and I've, I've learned a lot about a a culture but just about people and and myself really from working with you guys and seeing all these people's lives and uh, obviously having been down there and hopefully if, uh, next time we do this, we will all be together. But um, it's been really good experience for me and, uh, and musically it's really important. It's kind of been a, the catalyst for a lot of my own 
development and goals musically. So thank you for that too. Great. And, and folks, thanks for listening this morning. Um, a little um, housekeeping on Friday, October 22nd, uh, we're going to have the legendary Ingram Metz perform and and speak in, in sort of the same format that Emil did this morning. So um, so that it's going to be 1030 Friday, October 22nd. Um, Emil, thank you. Thank you again. And and I can't wait to hear about the uh, the or the Cobb documentary that we're working on. I know it's going to be fantastic. Well, Thanks, thank Neil. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen, for, for all your help today, too. Actually, thank, getting thank me up you to very much. All this stuff. So, thanks, Sally. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And if you have any other questions, uh, Kristen, feel free to share my email with, with folks. If I they, will. They and I also mm -hmm. ask me anything you want. I also want to say that this, this has been recorded. So, we're going to upload it to our website, Vimeo. YouTube. And so if anyone wants to watch this later on or just share it with people, let them let them know about it. And then also Spirit of the Bird is playing this month on our YouTube channel. Oh, and nice. every month, yep. And every month we're gonna, you know, show one of the documentaries and, and this month just happens to be Spirit of the Bird to pass the word along. Thank you.